Welcome everyone to the Deer Talk Now podcast. Uh, I'm Chris Behrens, Senior Editor at Deer and Deer Hunting, uh, standing in for Dan Schmidt today. We're here with longtime contributor Steve Bartilla, and we're going to talk about some public land stuff uh, near and dear to both of our hearts and growing up deer hunting. It, yeah, the, the thing that I think is kind of interesting is I'm sitting here looking at the Steve Bartella management expert, and we're going to talk about public ground. Yeah. The thing that a lot of people might not realize is to this day more seasons than not at least half of a season i'm spending hunting public land great it's i'll be honest i, I don't have to okay right and i'm not saying that in a jerky way i i, I apologize for saying it. but i do it because i'll tell you what i for the life of me i cannot understand how people think that they can go ahead and school the public on how to hunt when they absolutely never hunt like them ever right you know and at the same time the challenge you know oh because yeah. you heck you're slugging it out on public ground more than not you know uh it ain't the same world <laughs> yeah it's a lot different than i think what people realize a lot and that's we could kind of jump right into the topic uh, a little more specific is in your experience, like growing up and then now compared to what you see with with your, your job and everything too, what would you say is the biggest myth of public land hunting out there? The biggest myth of public... Now, there's exceptions to this. Oh, okay. always. There, there's, there's going to be truths to what I'm about to say. Yeah. Public land is just pummeled so bad that you can't even... I mean, it's not even worth going out there. It's just not even worth it. When I was a kid during gun season... In Wisconsin, I grew up in Wisconsin, lived in, was born and raised in Wisconsin my whole life. Okay. We take gun hunting, we, not trying to sound sacrilegious, but we essentially have three religions. Right. Beer, religion, well, four. Uh, the Packers. I, mean. I was going to say, you got to put the Packers in there and hunting. Yep. Okay. Gun hunting, when I was growing up, I mean, you didn't even, they didn't cancel school that week. But it was canceled. It's pretty much there. I'm the same way I grew up in central Wisconsin, and it's like, yeah, it's you got Christmas vacation, summer vacation, and you got deer, deer season. Deer season, yeah. it, it, without a doubt. Yeah. And when I was a kid, during deer season, oh, man, some of, and still to this day, but really when I was a kid, some of that public ground during gun season just got hammered. Oh, yeah, doing drives. Everybody did drives. Well, yeah. Which is perfectly legal, I oh, believe, yeah. yeah, to this day in Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So you've got, he, I mean, you've seen them, groups of 20, 30, 50 people. I will never forget. I'll never forget. I, I actually used to start trapping. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the first weekend of gun season. Be, I'd start beaver trapping then because everybody waited until after gun season. I will never forget driving down this backcountry road to this uh, beaver pond <clears throat> and seeing this group of, kid you not, 15 guys lined up along a road uh. all looking down on the same lower, maybe 20-acre field, and one deer ran out. Who Watch out, that? yeah. <laughs> it was not pretty. It was, I mean, it was quite honestly a little disgusting. But, um... <clears throat> What I'm getting at is when I was a kid, mm -hmm. oh, public land was, especially during gun season, yeah, pummeled. Today, there's pockets that are, but especially during bow season, there's so much public ground out there that does not get, that, you know what, most outfitted ground gets hunted harder than public ground, and that I am 1,000% wow. confident on. Okay. Most outfitted land is hunted harder than most public ground over the course of a season because those outfitters during bow season yeah have hunters out there every single day except for sunday for some of them that's true yeah that's, Th good that's point. it mm -hmm. you know whereas there's all sorts of public i shouldn't say this one of my favorite spots to hunt public ground is almost within walking distance of my house oh nice you know um and yeah don't get me wrong, you sure aren't dragging a 190-inch buck off of that thing. Yeah, it's the thing, that perspective. you got to still keep in perspective, yeah. But I killed a three-and-a-half-year-old there two years ago. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So that, that to me, is the biggest myth. Okay. You just, you can't find, you can't find 
you know, places to hunt it, and it's so dangerous. It's just so dangerous. Oh, place. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, a lot of, as I say, I hate saying this because the people that are experiencing experiencing the exceptions, oh, I'm making them furious right now. <laughs> <laughs> because And there are. There's plenty of places out there that truly are pumped. Yeah, yeah. Most of them, no, they ain't. Right. And if you're willing to do any work at all, you can get to areas that are completely left alone. But I'm going to give you a second myth. And that was years and years ago when I first was making this a career. Mm-hmm. I had to take every writing assignment I could get. Okay. I didn't enjoy doing trophy buck profiles, articles. I, I, they're just not, I want how to. Yeah, your style, yeah. yeah. It's just not, mine is meat and potatoes, how to teach me. Okay. okay. Now, there are stuff. I always got little oh, yeah, tidbits. Oh, learned the little tips, yeah. From the hunters. Mm-hmm. But most of them were, hey, this huge buck showed up. I killed it. There he was. Type yeah. story. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know that almost half of those, and when we're talking typicals, they've got to be at least, at least upper 80s. Okay. Clean net mm-hmm. in order for it to qualify for an article like this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> non-typicals, you're looking at over 220. Close to half of them came off of ground that is open to every and anyone. Really? To, of the articles I did. Now, wow. this is anecdotal data. Sure, it's a small sample, but it's it, still it's a sample. A little bit misleading, but here I... So there would be another myth. Bucks like this just don't exist out there. They do. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing that I found so absolutely fascinating. You know, who's killing those bucks on the, on the land that everybody can hunt? Mm-hmm. People that don't know how to hunt. Why? If that buck is doing what it's supposed to do for smart hunters like us. Right. What we were oh, taught. We, we yeah. killed him well before he got to be 185 inches. Right. You know, um, whereas what ended up, this kid I did an article on, I won't name his name, because not because of him, but because of his father. His father stuck him over here to get rid of him. Oh, Okay. <laughs> Send him down on that patch of brush, like, eh, he's not going to see anything. This, he's not going to get in the way. This yeah. other kid I did a story on. Now, it wasn't technically public ground, but it might might as well have been. It was his uncle's ground. Everybody and anybody, don't tell anybody, no. All of oh, his relatives okay. hunt there, blah, sure. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he ended up setting up by the highway. Okay. Because nobody's, nobody's hunting that little strip of cover there by the highway. Yeah, well, there's no deer there. Yeah, just send him down so, there. Yeah. Well, no, he yeah. he did it on his own. Oh, okay, okay. And I was like, okay, my uncles hunt, my uncles are hunting over I got cousins over there. There's guys I don't even know hunting over here. You know what? I'm just going to go set up down by the highway. Yeah. You know, and he told me that he actually thought that he made, somebody threw something out the window once when he was sitting in the stand and thought, I could actually be hit by somebody throwing stuff out. That's how close he was. Wow. 248 inch buck. Wow. Yeah. Why? Because nobody was hunting. Nobody goes there, yeah. The ditch by that. Now, he was legally far enough off. Oh, and sure. All that good stuff. Yeah. But nobody, nobody hunts there. Okay. Now, how do bucks get to be mature on public ground? They get to be mature on public ground public realm by not doing what we're what we believe they're supposed to do absolutely look for those areas that everybody else is ignoring that's my trick on the spot that's almost within walking distance of my house okay i can see the parking lot the buck i shot there <clears throat> handful of years back a couple years back um was actually leaving the big woods, crossing the swamp grass to get to the little pocket of cover that I was sitting in while at least two different, well, not at least, two different hunters were doing rattling sequences. Yeah, he was going the opposite way. Okay. And that's something else I've picked up about hunting public ground over the years is, yeah, leave the gadgets at home. Yeah. Seriously. These, I mean, don't get me wrong, Grunt tubes, synthetic antlers, real antlers, all that junk. You you put a person out on Utopia where most of this stuff is filmed, it works really well. Oh, absolutely, it works, yeah. It works really well. Now let's think about that animal that's living on public ground. 
every idiot like you and me are out there stomping all over the place and we are all excited to check out our new i'm gonna trying to come up with some ridiculous buck growl snorter ruiz call <laughs> right you know that for 25 bucks it's guaranteed to bring in any deer blah, blah. i think you're the first to try that right i think you're the second how about the third <laughs> now you might as well be standing up in your tree stand jumping up and down screaming hey look at me i'm over here don't come over as i said that buck was actually leaving yeah the big woods coming to me now granted he was coming there because he bedded there mm-hmm. and that's how he survived to get to be three and a half on this little piece of pub, public ground he was bedded where we weren't exactly. during the daylight <clears throat> but as i said there were two different i'm not exaggerating two different hunters actually rattling as i saw him leave the woods and slip across the grass to my location don't tr- tr- draw attention to yourself out there yeah i've seen the s- same kind of things like all the scent wicks everybody leaves out all the tags they leave their stands up cutting branches throw them out and you you've said it in, in a lot of your articles too it's like how we train deer are just like dogs you can train them and they may not be smart in the human sense, but they start to associate those scents and those sounds with danger. And then they get shot at well, a couple times, and they learn real quick where to go, just like you said, where nobody else goes. The way I always the way I always articulated it in seminars, you're no different than your dog at home. Mm-hmm. Now, don't try this. I, I'm not suggesting anybody does this, okay? But imagine if you put a dog dish out in your kitchen, fill it up with food, water right next to it Mm -hmm. now you stand in the corner and every time but that dish is those two dishes full all the time anytime that dog wants it can go over there get a drink of water and get a bite of food but if it does so between sunrise and sunset you're going to kick it in the butt as hard as you can across that room how long do you think it'll be before that dog figures out hmm if i wait till after dark I can literally feast on this stuff. Yeah, this guy's gone. He's sleeping. He's doing whatever. He's not here. Yeah, same thing. We train dogs through positive and negative reinforcement. Dogs are not capable of analytical thought any more than deer are. Right. Okay. But do good. Here's a treat. Do bad. I know there's various ways you can just dis- you can give them negative reinforcement. Right. For me, right now, with my dog Cletus, he goes in the kennel when he does bad. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, aren't we doing that exact same thing with deer? The only difference is, is our negative reinforcements. We ain't putting them in the kennel. Really? We ain't kicking them in the butt. You know, many times their negative reinforcement equals death. Right. You know, or injury. Or life-threateningly terrifying experience. Absolutely, yeah. So just a, a great example of this. <clears throat> I was consulting for an outfitter in northern Missouri. I'm driving across this huge CRP field. A eh, quarter mile away. There goes a doe and two fawns. I hmm, wonder what spooked them. Looking around, seeing if there's a coyote chasing them. I mean, this tall grass, so sure. I can't. But maybe I can. Ah, I have no idea. Go down to the bottom, find a great spot to set up. Okay. Come back the next day with the stands in the back of the truck now. Going down to set up third to a half mile away there goes deer running across the crp what the heck is going on here you know the odds of me catching this two days in a row at the exact same just weird go set up the stand talking to the outfitter that night and you guys got a big coyote problem around here well we got quite a few coyotes why well the last two days i've been driving down to that bottom going across that big crp field there's deer running First time, quarter mile, second time, third to a half mile away. Okay. I, the only thing I can figure is they're being chased by coyotes. Mm-hmm. Looks at me. Steve, you idiot. How do you think the locals hunt down here? Oh, they just see a truck? Yeah. You got it. There you go. You know, now, it's not legal to hunt down there that way. Right. But here, I cannot tell you how many times I've went ahead and said, 
you know what, getting a, the worst thing you can do, the worst thing you can do is have a deer watch you climb out of your stand. No, you either sit there and wait them out. You know, you can go ahead and what I'm about to say is a little bit dangerous. You can toss a stick at them and right before it hits the ground, snort at them, which nine times out of 10, that works awesome. Those deer take off and one times out of 10, all of them are standing there looking at that idiot up in the tree. <laughs> you know, and wow, do you ever feel really yeah. <laughs> really stupid when that's the case um or the other thing just have somebody drive out and come get you bump the deer off right well that's great unless people are hunting out of vehicles right then they have went ahead and associated that with danger you know whatever you do don't drive an atv out there they know well there was a place i managed for a bunch of years that had uh active oil leases on it oh okay now there were people out there six days a week driving atv from the different oil rigs sure i'm not kidding i could drive within 20 yards of virtually any deer out some of the more mature deer yeah you got about 50 yards away and they would just pop off a little uh, bit okay but you never ever scared a deer on an atv out there okay period well it's the same thing yeah they learn that that's not really a danger if they're not getting shot at from it or chased then exactly they... you're you're training your dog at home mm -hmm. and that is what we are doing out on public ground absolutely yeah which is why so many of the things that we're taught don't work that well there because we're actually training them no you're High winds and rain. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to go out hunting, Chris. Right. It, those deer won't be moving. They're not. This. Nothing's going to move in that, yeah. But yet on public land, how many hunters are out during those conditions? A very few, exactly. I'm not saying that this is the case with every deer, but I am thoroughly convinced that a portion of the more mature deer, mm -hmm. they realize when it's nasty and I'm not supposed to move, hey, I got this place to myself. I can actually, I actually can move today. Yep. Now, um, and it all comes back to what you said, training, mm -hmm. positive and negative reinforcements. How many other yard apes have been out there using that scent? Right. How many other yard apes have been out there using those calls? How many of them have been out there rattling? How many of them have been out there using decoys? I would not, ex I would not suggest doing that on public ground during, during gun season no. for certain. And, but, and how many of them are sitting on a field edge too, doing all this stuff? Mm -hmm. And then you wonder, oh, well, why doesn't anything come out in the daylight out in the, out in the open? It's the same kind of thing. Well, and there's a great transition into what I've found as honestly the key to this. First part, draw no attention to yourself mm -hmm. whatsoever. Don't get me wrong, when I'm hunting Utopia, I will throw the book at them. But the more pressure there is, the smaller your margin for error. Yeah. You know, the, the more wary these animals are going to be. Okay. The other part, get to where no one else is. Mm -hmm. Simply, not, not necessarily, it doesn't always. We all think, you got to get three miles back in oh, there. Oh, yeah. Really big woods. Beat everybody, beat everybody else out there. Yeah. For one thing. I'm pretty sure that hunters have two learning disabilities. Well, one. You know, but it's applied in two different ways. We have no concept of distance. Yeah. Because every stand that I've ever seen that somebody's telling me they're X feet up in the Yeah, you can cut that about in half. Mm -hmm. And every single public land hunter that I know. That, uh, I put on at least 10 miles today. Well, maybe you put on two. Exactly, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. You, <laughs> you know. go up a couple ridges and down, maybe through a swamp, and it feels like 10, but it, yeah. Exactly. Quarter mile, half mile, maybe. The big things I look for is, first off, the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Where's that spot where no one else is going? Because no idiot is going to hunt there. Such as the spot I described not far from my house. Mm -hmm. There's another smack dab central Wisconsin is another spot like that. That a year before that, I drug a buck out. I had to actually check the rules to see how close to the road I could legally hunt. Okay. Now, when you have those little tiny pockets, mm -hmm. but you had all this big timber over here. Everybody ignores those little tiny pockets. When you have that pond, 
Yep. All that timber and just a little bit of cover around that. Yeah, some cattails or some it, tag alders. Yeah. Look for those areas of deer cover that everybody else is ignoring. Mm-hmm. That's low hanging fruit. Then look for a barrier. Maybe as you described. I'll tell you what, I did some hunting in public ground down in Illinois on a Girl Scout camp. I thought Buffalo County had ridges. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. And (laughs) if you could get over, all you had to do to hunt there was sign in in the morning. Okay. And then there was, uh, don't quote me on this, but like 800 acres. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice chunk of timber. Yeah. Um, You got over one ridge. You got to the top of one ridge. Okay. You had that place to yourself. Yeah, nobody else. Is, but yeah, from that, from about court, uh, three fourths of the way up that ridge out to the road. Oh, forget it. Or that was hammered. Yeah. But there just was one nasty ridge that ran north south. You got over that ridge. It was yours. Uh, swamps. For whatever reason, we seem to be allergic to water. Mm-hmm. If you got to do anything more than wear rubber boots, oh no, no, we we can't do. Well, there's such thing as hip boots, hip boots, waders, waders canoes, the kayaks are so light now. Yeah, uh, tech, John, but whatever. Yeah, um, that same the same general area I was hunting down in Illinois, along the Illinois River is a bunch of Corps of Engineer land. Okay, okay. that Corps of Engineer land is open, open to hunting. Open to the public, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that core engineer land's pretty good. And as far as sign goes, man, it is tore the heck up. You want to kill something, go to one of those islands. Because that's where those bucks are during the daylight. Right. They, you can actually listen. And this is what I did. You get in there, you get to the island well before first light, mm-hmm. and then you listen to them swim. Oh, okay. The, oh, here they come. Here they get come. ready. Nice. <laughs> oh. But wow, the sign along that river. Big rubs, tore up, scrapes. Every, and every time I saw fresh sign, I was smiling ear to ear because they're going to put in even more time on this creek bank. Right. With the deer over there on the island. During the daytime, during the daylight. Exactly. Yeah. Takes a lot of work. Yeah, first getting up early and then you get to drive out there, but not many guys are going to put in the work. Drag your John boat out. If it's cold and it's wet and there's some ice... Mm-hmm. Another real, uh, another in Wisconsin, and you know, most northern states, for heck, most any state for that matter, another common example, clear cuts. Mm-hmm. They go ahead and clear cut a uh, <clears throat> quarter mile long stretch along the road. That grows up in an aspen. Nasty Super thicket. Super thick, yeah. You ever try walking across one of those with a tree stand on your back good luck yeah uh, it, it it's not fun no no really isn't fun but once you get to that backside, if you can make it that quarter mile across through that junk mm-hmm. you get to that backside. you have as as you know deer creatures of the edge mm-hmm you think that makes a nice edge for them to cross, to, to travel on that backside? Oh, exactly. And at the same time, I'm telling you, outside of gun season, mm-hmm. will somebody go ahead and do a stalk through there? Sure. But you're talking about bow hunting or something. Like, and, you know, in Wisconsin, you may have an entire group go through and drive that. Sure, gun but, season, yeah. But bow hunting? Oh, man, you got that to yourself back there. Right. You know, Look for those barriers. You find the barriers, they go ahead and create little oases. Mm -hmm. And the irony of all this is so much of what I learned for deer management actually came from public ground. How do you think I learned the power of a sanctuary? Same exact thing right there, yeah. Those deer on those islands... You think they weren't moving all darn day long out on that island? Of course they were, but they were not... Good luck finding one over on the creek bank. Exactly, yeah. No, until after dark. Mm-hmm. If you can go ahead and create a sanctuary, or in this case, natural sanctuaries occur, it really doesn't matter. As long as you're talking, it's got to be more than an acre. Yeah, you know, it's got to have a little room and you know, some good I, I cover. Mean, heck, but something is, geez, some of those, well, the island is a bad example. Um, There were, geez. 
in that case, deer were bedding on some of the islands that are smaller. But look at that area that's cut off by that clear-cut regrowth. The mm -hmm. other side of that nasty, nasty drainage ditch. The other side of that huge ridge. You know, if you really have 10 acres, that's enough. Yeah, definitely. It doesn't that take much. That is enough. And within that, within that area, these deer move very freely during daylight. Outside of it, oh, forget it. Yeah. You know, it's that, go back to that training. It's not that they're so analytical. They aren't. They are not capable of analytical Right, they're not far. solving problems. They're not thinking. It's, oh, okay. When I leave this area, I either have a near-death experience or a very scary one. Right. When I stay in this area during this time, everything's always awesome. Everything's fun, yeah. I don't get shot at. I don't smell humans. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's in a weird way, it's natural selection on display. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, um, <clears throat> so, within those pockets, you actually have some pretty darn good daylight deer movement. Mm -hmm. And frankly, not that this has anything to do with this, but... That's why I put such a priority on sanctuaries when it comes to management. All those, we all love to complain about the neighbors. Oh, if they only hunted like I did. Oh, if they didn't. If they, if they, if, if they, they, if they, it. if they, if they. No. Those horrid hunting neighbors can actually be, for one thing, this is supposed to be fun. Right. They have every right to hunt on their ground every darn way legally they want to exactly just like you do mm -hmm. if you've got the right to do play your games on your side of the fence they got every bit the same right to play their games on their side exactly of the fence. but hmm if i can go ahead and set up my ground so i don't have to hunt this area over here what happens when that neighbors dragging his car hurts on the way out to the stand a half hour before dark oh they scared the deer to my safe area exactly the more they do that the more my safe area gets better and better and better mm -hmm. and while i'm watching the hunting quality for the entire area go downhill with each day of hunting season the quality of my hunting keeps going up Exactly. It translates very well. Yeah. Yep. And I actually learned that from hunting public ground. Yeah. <laughs> because, wow, in this little area here, I got great deer moon. But every time I sit out there or talk to any of those guys, they're sucking pond scum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Matt! Okay, everybody, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to thank one of our sponsors. Today's episode of Deer Talk Now podcast is brought to you by Scent Killer Gold Laundry Detergent with Power Boost Plus from Wildlife Research Center. Featuring ultra-concentrated odor-fighting power and ultra-premium dirt and stain-removing powder, Scent Killer Gold provides twice as many loads per ounce compared to regular Scent Killer Laundry Detergent. I use this stuff year-round, not just for hunting season. I have allergies. This stuff is hypoallergenic. It's scent free. I use it on all my clothes. No, I don't smell like a GQ guy when I go out or anywhere, but Scent Killer Gold Laundry Detergent really helps me and it's very economical. You only have to use that little cap, that's it. One little cap of that stuff in an entire extra large load of laundry. Pull your clothes out, smell it. There's not gonna be any scent there at all. It's pretty incredible stuff. Take your scent elimination to an extreme level by looking for those gold caps. Wildlife actually owns the copyright on the color of those caps because a lot of other competitors have been trying to rip it off and have their packaging look like Scent Killer Gold. Get some at your local sporting goods dealer or check it out at wildlife.com. Uh, one thing I wanted to go back that you mentioned before with the calling and some of the aggressive tactics do you find that even like during the hardcore rut stages, maybe on public land it worked for you or you don't even the tr only... try it? Like the calling, the I, rattling. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you're getting at, and I'm trying to think of how to put it. And that is the longer I do this stuff, the less aggressive I get on public ground. Okay. Utopia? Oh, heck, I'm more than happy to get more and more and more and more aggressive every single year. Okay. 
but it's going to work now. What the heck? Let's try it. But here's the difference. I figured this out a few years ago. On average, I go ahead and kill a three and a half year old or older buck, and please don't take that as me preaching. Legal deer are legal deer. Yeah, absolutely. They make you happy. Yeah. Please harvest them legally and ethically um, within reason. Personally, for me, it's a three and a half year old buck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when I kill a three and a half year old buck on public ground, I'll be honest with you, it isn't. I, thankfully, my wife believes her job on this earth is to keep me humble. <laughs> but when I kill a three and a half year old buck on public, that's a big she's deal. She's got some work to do. Yeah, it's a big deal. <laughs> because, it, I mean, it's I, a I, challenge. I'm sorry that makes me sound like a jerk, but I feel like no. I accomplished something. Absolutely, you have. Yeah. Quite honestly. For regular people, a lot of this public ground, you kill a year and a half old buck, you accomplish something, buddy. Yeah. You did. A buck's a buck on public land. Oh. Yeah. Be damn proud of it. I don't you care if you are. Right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, me personally, I have advantages. I don't have a real job. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that makes a big difference. You have extra time and yep, yep, you're flexible. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and I'm s- supposed to be good at this stuff. You know, so that's. I end up setting my targets, but it's going to take sure. me, it's going to take me on average three to five years to get it done. Mm-hmm. Every three to five years on average over the course of my lifetime, since I started going for three and a half, which mm-hmm. was, geez, over 30 years ago now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. An average of one every three to five years. Okay. Utopia. And that, that just goes to show the challenge of it. Like Exactly. This is Utopia? Not, yeah. Um, I've had days like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I'm saying days where I've seen, oh, I blew that one. Oh, don't worry. Here comes another one. Right. Oh, he didn't come in quite close enough. Let's try some calling the rattling. <laughs> oh, he's turning around. Okay. Okay. Here he got. Oh, he hung, hang up. He's hung up. <sighs> what do you do now? Well, not much. When he turns, you call a little bit more. Can try again, yeah. But he's not that dumb. He's just been standing there for 10 minutes looking for these deer that aren't there. Right. As soon as he turns, he's not going to think, oh, they're back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so he, yeah, yeah, he, yeah they turn. Bat. Bat. Yeah, he just flicked his hat, tail at me. He's still going the other way. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, um, no worries. Yeah. Oh, here comes there's a third another, night arrow. Here's another one, yeah. You know, I mean, I, yes, that would be a... That is a very good day on Utopia. Oh, yeah. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But I'm not worried about blowing an opportunity on Utopia anywhere near to the level that I am on pummel ground. Right. And that is where practice techniques really have a lot to do with. We are so good at practicing for 3D shoots. Mm-hmm. We are so good at practicing for shooting paper. We suck at practicing for actually killing deer. How often are you sitting out there with a deer at exactly 20 yards? You're standing there in your shorts and a t-shirt. Right. Both feet on the ground. Oh, there's a nice stiff wind. Let, let's just don't draw yet. Wait for the breeze to pass. Exactly. Oh, oh okay. All oh, right. I got now, a mosquito on my nose. I'll no, just wait a all second. Right. Yeah. I'm on full dr- oh, my peep isn't quite right. Okay, I'll adjust it. Yeah. Uh, okay, now take it. Settle in there. Nice. Okay. Oh, no, no. Just nice. Okay. Calm. okay. Just, don't rush it. When you're ready. <laughs> that doesn't happen no. out in the deer woods. No. Practice like you hunt. Right. You want to know what it's going to be like for your arrow flight in the light rain? Really easy way to figure it out. Try it out. Get yeah. out there and practice in the light rain. Yep. You want to know what a stiff crosswind is going to do to your arrow? Mm-hmm. Get out there and practice in a stiff crosswind. Yep. Make sure you... I, I have a tree stand set up in my yard. I don't have a ground blind because I just pop it up when I need to. Right. Okay. Absolutely every single item I'm going to be hunting with, I have practiced with before I go out there. And I am, when I'm doing these practicing, I'm not sitting there, okay, I got all day. It's okay, this is, this is going to be a quick one, right. snapshot. Mm-hmm. You know, and just make it as realistically mimicking the real world that you're going to be hunting as you humanly possibly can. Because guess what? 
you don't have, generally speaking, three cracks at three different mature bucks in the same day when you're out on public ground. You're dang lucky to get one. Yeah. And you either make it count, or you know what? If you're following my formula, yeah, it's going to be probably another three to five years before you have another chance. That's a very good point. I've learned that, too, is like you get a crack at a good, depending on what your standards are, what you're going for. But, yeah, big buck, when you're putting in your homework, you get one, maybe two good shots on public land a season in your own state. Again, depending on your own time, it's like I've learned that, too, since I was like a teenager and you just go out there and I messed up so much. And now it's like that practice, focus on that moment of, being a killer at that moment nothing else matters because you're only going to get one shot well and that's yeah. that, that's the other as i said earlier there was two reasons that i do the public ground stuff to this day part of it's that i really enjoy the challenge oh yeah that that's easy for someone who's spoiled like me and gets to hunt utopias well you're fortunate okay. yeah through yeah, your career I, and everything well, I, yeah i'm spo- when it comes to hunting i'm spoiled it's not fortunate i am spoiled <laughs> rotten and i know it okay um it's a lot easier to appreciate public ground when you're spoiled rotten. Yeah. You know, then this is all I got. Okay. But the other reason is it does so much good for your skill as a hunter. It ain't oh, yeah. even funny. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, I will, if somebody, any listener out there who, I, as long as it's not one of the very, very easy states. Okay. So some, and that, that's some, some it's, it's we're, different, we're, ta- yeah. we're sitting here talking public land, but we're coming from Wisconsin. Right. And that's generally what we're saying when we're talking public ground. I'm telling you, the rest of the world isn't Wisconsin. Right. You get down to Iowa, you get into Illinois, you get into, Can- oh my, Kansas. Kansas, Nebraska, Kansas. Dakotas. Yeah. You want, you want to go. I, if you're willing to do it yourself. hmm you want to go on a hunt of a lifetime? Forget an outfit or go out to Kansas on the public ground. Yeah, you'll see deer because it's wide open, less oh, people, big they, deer. Yeah. Th- they're, they've got walk-in ground over there that is off the chart. What? Well, it's better what, than a lot of private ground, yeah. A uh, guy from Rice Lake, Wisconsin. Okay. One of the trophy buck articles I did was on him. He goes out to Kansas to hunt public. He's got private ground mm-hmm. that he has permission to hunt. But no, he's out there hunting the walking ground. And he ended up shooting, I think that was 260 something. Wow. Off of walking ground in Kansas. None of the deer hunters were going to this area because of duck hunters went there. Okay. You think that buck gives a darn about duck hunters? No. No. <laughs> Not one bet. And he, he arrowed that slob as the duck hunters are banging just a couple hundred yards away. That's true, though, yeah. yeah. But there again, it's like, yeah, Kansas public land. Iowa public land is not Wisconsin, Michigan, or down south or like out east. I can't imagine trying to hunt Pennsylvania, New York, yeah, Rhode exactly. Island, some right. of these states. Yeah, all public land is not right. created equal. Right, it, it it really is. Right, but like you said, if you can have success and learn on public ground, well, yeah. Th- thanks. What I yeah. was actually getting at here is anybody in any of these pummeled states that are every other year dragging antlers off of that public ground Mm -hmm. i'm sorry to swear but i will put i will go ahead and put a hundred bucks on you every dang time over these experts absolutely yeah as far as you know what you're doing exactly and don't let anybody tell you different yeah no don't feel bad if you're if you are consistently dragging animals off of pummel public ground you know what the heck you're doing, period, end of story. And don't you, I don't care how many inches that animal has or does not have on its head. Exactly. You know, you know what you're doing and you're dang good at it. Exactly. Don't you dare let other people make you feel inferior. And as long as I'm on that kick, for whatever reason, we have went ahead and decided that, oh, that buck has way more inches on his head so he's really smart and hard to hunt trust me i've killed a whole bunch of really stupid bucks with a whole bunch of inches on their head Mm -hmm. as a matter of a fact i'm a far better hunter when it comes to killing really big stupid bucks with a whole bunch of inches on their head than I am a three and a half year old 120 inch buck on public ground yeah it's a different animal totally i mean still the same habits but Inches has nothing 
to do with intelligence or challenge whatsoever in any way, shape, or form. Right. And then take it another step further. It is far easier to shoot a four and a half year old buck when you got a bunch of five and a half, six and a half, and even a few seven and a halfs running around. Mm-hmm. And nobody else, nobody else chasing them. Yeah. No, exactly. Have well, them all to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Or very few well, other people hunters. People can hunt there, yeah. but you're not hunting. It. You're not shooting anything under four and a half years old. Yeah. Or you're going to get fined, and you're going to, and you will not be back. Well, how tough is that buck to hunt compared to that year and a half in December, right, on public ground? If that year and a half year old buck made it to December on through gun season, yeah, he ain't stupid, right? He's he learned a gotten, lot. He may have gotten lucky on some things, yeah, but he is experienced absolutely quite honestly quite a bit more than those four and a half year old bucks on a lot of ground out there yeah you talk to guys shooting anything on public ground like in states like we're talking about and every every one you get and you skin them and stuff and there's scars bullet holes broadheads in them it's oh, like the, the, yeah yeah the great point the last two that i well the two bucks that i did mention mm-hmm. so far in here that i've killed on public they one, I'm quite certain, had actually been shot twice wow. with guns. The other, I found broadhead. Wow. That yep. just shows shows to go. It, it goes to show you how tough they are and how resilient they are, and then they learn oh, to survive through exactly. that stuff. Yeah. Um, well, one more question, I guess. In your travels, in your public, public land hunting and stuff over the years, through your career, and what would be your number one state? for public land hunting that you've experienced? Alberta. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, I mean, that's almost not even fair, though, because most of it's crown land. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and, In America, and, let's say. And legally, <laughs> you have to have a guide. That's what I wondered, yeah. Um, <clears throat> up there, unless you're really good friends with people. Uh, but <laughs> um, I'll be honest with you, Kansas is tough to beat. yeah. Kansas is real tough to beat. Iowa actually has way more. I, I've got a friend slash old cameraman who from 16 on has shot 260 inch bucks a year. The overwhelming majority of them come from public land in Iowa. Wow. He lives in Iowa. Okay. But there, there's, are there pockets of land in Kansas that are hunted hard. Mm-hmm. Are there pockets of land in Iowa that are hunted? Oh, of sure. course there are. Yeah. There are pockets of public ground that are hunted hard in those states. But I'm telling you, total, we ain't in Kansas no more. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's a different world from Wisconsin. Yeah. And unfortunately, 90% of the people that just heard that have no clue what I'm talking about because <laughs> I'm an old man. Um, <laughs> and the 10% that do know... Yeah, you're right. They have no clue what you're talking about. (laughs) But no, Kansas, Wisconsin, Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, yeah, from Wisconsin on, those states are a different animal than the Kansases, the Iowas, the Missouris. Missouri's got a bunch of, and I'll tell you what, northern Missouri People from northern Missouri probably won't appreciate me saying this, but it was a darn good place to hunt. Okay, kind of a sleeper state, if you will, yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, Illinois has got some great public ground. Indiana's got some pretty darn good public ground. Most, just that, I've long believed that that latitude belt right there. Okay. You know, just drop down a state from Wisconsin, you know, Right along there is the sweet spot. Okay. Because you're far enough north that you're and you're still dealing with the largest subspecies of whitetails. Mm-hmm. But we don't, they don't have winter. Right. We're looking outside and it just snowed again. And like up north, they got like six inches yesterday, whereas down there. It's, well, and yeah, they, and they as hard. we're recording this, what, it's April 4th, 5th, something like that? Yeah. Oh. So, because this will be delayed, look, and you know when it comes out in yeah. August, they're really it's snowing in Wisconsin. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they don't have comparatively. They don't have well. Wisconsin came up with a winter severity index. Yep. You know, 
so many points for every day it's below this temperature so many points for every day it's above the snowfall mm -hmm. how long it la all that stuff was factored in in order to gauge how bad winter was right for, yeah they never using the winter severity index they never have bad winters right. down there ever you know in january at most <clears throat> these deer are pawing through a foot of snow to get what buds no to get soybeans, soybeans and, corn. and corn yeah you know i mean it's that belt right there is pretty darn good okay because when a buck reaches spring we all think antlers that buck's body ain't thinking antlers that buck's body doesn't that buck does not survive based on his antlers he survives based on his physical well-being right so during winter they're re even in the midwest mm -hmm. most of the midwest will be exceptions to this but they tend to run a negative energy balance okay meaning that each day they actually expend more calories than they're able to take in from their food okay okay when it comes to spring the first thing they and keep in mind they just went through the rut which is going to make them lose 25 to 30 percent body weight all sorts of injuries blah 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 now you get to spring and then they run the negative energy balance Think about that for a second. 25 to 30% body weight in two months. Right. Every year. Two month time. Yeah. Losing over a quarter of your body weight. That's not good for an animal. Right. And then, yeah, you got to <laughs> sit through cold and now, weather and snow. Now you go through the negative energy balance mm -hmm. period of winter, and then you get to spring. They are not putting that energy towards their racks until they build that body back up. Okay. okay. So the further north you get, the more stressful those winters are, generally speaking, the further behind the antler development. Mm -hmm. The awesome thing about Alberta is they ain't afraid of humans in the area I hunt. They aren't. They're afraid of wolves. They're afraid of bears. They're afraid of cats. But they ain't afraid of me. Right. Which is a little bit humbling, but still, I embrace it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it's going to take them an extra year to come close to producing the same amount of headgear that that, generally speaking, right, is that buck in Illinois does. Right. And one in bad Indiana in Ohio. Yeah, and one bad winter could set them back, oh, heck, wipe them out for. You know, could set the herd back 10 years. Well, one more, bad winter yeah. and he's dead. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, heck, it doesn't even take a bad winter necessarily. Right. You know, depending on how stressful the rut was. Mm -hmm. So I, any, that belt right there, the Ohio's, the Indiana's, the Illinois's, the Iowa's, the northern Missouri's, mm -hmm. <laughs> Kansas, right, is in my book, that's a sweet that's spot. That's a sweet spot. Okay. Yeah. So where exactly is this public land you hunted there? <laughs> no, um, just kidding. Actually, I'd be more than happy. In Kansas, smack dab center. Okay. <laughs> um, there's a big, I actually stayed at a, I rented a hotel room for three weeks and then fought with them for a month after that because they weren't were willing to honor the rate that they said. Oh, okay. But uh, just dead center, <laughs> dead center Kansas. If you, if you go, stop at the DNRs. And get walk-in map, oh, walk-in yeah. land maps. That's huge. Even in Wisconsin, the walk, the private land open to hunting can be very productive. Because one, it's under the radar a little bit. It's not marked. You gotta do some research. Well, ex exactly. Everybody, yeah. everybody knows that county land. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the state land. Everybody knows the federal land. Right. And why? Because it's always been there. Yep. Your granddaddy hunted it. Your daddy hunted it. You've hunted it since you were near. Who's checking every year with the DNRs on who's enrolling in open managed forest cropland? Exactly. Not, I mean, yeah, will you have competition? Sure. Sure, you will. Not but as much. But there's not anywhere near the number of people that are going in and getting that information every year right. as the ones who know about those federal exactly or government lands. Yeah. Yep. We could go on and on with that, too. It's like all, all, the, all the different kinds of public land out there, different states, different times of year and everything. Um, I but, think we'll have to cut it off. Well, I, Today, I'd like unless to, you got one more point. I'd like to say one thing. Sure. Though, before, and that is, don't, and I thought the way you started this was, uh, don't believe all the hype. Okay. We go ahead 
and scare ourselves into not doing so dang many things these days. It ain't even fun. Right. No. That's a good it, point. Get, oh, I shouldn't do that. Probably I shouldn't do that because that's not what it, we're taught. Just it's go, like go, just try it. Yeah. Go, go out there and try. Yeah. And, you know, and if you find that this place is overrun and you can't, well, go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. You know, um, if you have a vehicle, almost every state and every province, and I'm can't speak for Mexico, but I bet you they even have public land down in Mexico Probably, you yeah. can hunt. Yeah. You know, um, if you're willing to put, unfortunately, burn some gas these days, yeah. you, know, um, you can get to a lot of different public grounds. And Dan Schmidt <laughs> taught me something years and years and years ago. He mentioned it offhand. If you don't own your ground, there's one guarantee. You're going to lose your hunting spot. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. So... Why not have three, four different places on hunting on public ground in your back pocket? That's a that's so a very good point. Things go to when things go to snot mm-hmm. in your honey hole. Heck, the, the landowner decides that we got to do some we got to do some woodwork yep. out here and decides to, to cut timber for firewood. Yep. You got options. You got options. And public ground gives you options and if you're willing to put in a little bit of work a mm-hmm. little bit of re- you can little find, time you can find some decent spot and the one thing that i will mention that i that we didn't t- yes there are a ridiculous amount of challenges to hunting public ground. oh absolutely yeah. there truly are yeah I, i'm not sitting here trying to pretend that there aren't and that this is anywhere near as easy as on tv and that it's not right okay you're gonna face challenges you're gonna get frustrated but, but but it's not as bad as they keep telling you it is. Exactly. Yeah. And one thing, too, like you said, with uh, getting out there and just trying and exploring, that is one of my favorite parts of public land hunting. And we're fortunate to have a fair amount of it around here. It's just like, it's just fun getting out and exploring new areas. New country, learning new spots is a huge part of the attraction and the challenge. But it just makes it, it keeps it fun, keeps it did, fresh. Did you play any sports back in school? I played ice hockey. Okay. How good would you have been at ice hockey at the game if you hadn't practiced all year? Exactly. That's a good point. Every time we go out there, we're practicing. Mm -hmm. You're learning every every time. Every time we scout, every time we hunt, every time it's practice. Yep. Even when you mess up, miss a shot, spook a deer, it's like, well, learn something from it. Yeah. Exactly. I can't speak for anybody out there, but I'll tell you what, I don't learn much from success. But wow, is failure a heck of a good teacher. Exactly. Uh, so don't be afraid to face plant. Uh, it's heck. I had a professor back in college. This kid was really good at skiing. Every time you go on a ski trip, how many times you fall? None. Well, so you don't want to get better? That's y- a good point. Y- you don't fall. Yeah. <laughs> you're not you're not pushing yourself. Exactly. If you're not spooking some deer. Or going with deerless sits, you know, not seeing anything, you're not really learning anything. So I think that's a good way to, to end the segment is just Works for me. <laughs> get out there and try it. And if you fail, just get back out there and sooner or later you'll find success. And no matter how frustrated it gets, remember, this stuff's supposed to be fun. Exactly. Keep, Keep it, it fun. Way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thanks, Steve, for, for coming on uh, this uh, this episode of Deer Talk Now podcast. And for Dan Schmidt, who couldn't be here today, I'm Chris Behrens. And uh, hit that like button, download, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you next time. This episode is brought to you by Drop Tine Spirits and their premium 12-point bourbon whiskey. The story of Drop Tine's finest bourbon starts with being double barrel aged. What this means is they first aged the bourbon in new charred oak barrels in America's heartland, then send it to California to be finished in the salt air of the Pacific in the finest brandy barrels. Finishing their bourbon in brandy barrels was the choice of many trials to find flavors as unique as the drop tine deer. They wanted a bourbon that is not only warm to the palate, but it would sip smoothly and leave notes of fruit behind. They found the perfect brandy barrels in the Russian River Valley near Sonoma, California, and what they created is a bourbon whiskey that exhibits a sweet, floral, almost honey-like aroma balanced by caramel, toasted wood, brown sugar, and toffee. 12-point bourbon is only available online. 
To get a taste for yourself after the hunt, visit droptime.com. Deer Talk Now is also brought to you by HuntStand and the new HuntStand Pro app. Let me tell you, I've been using the HuntStand app for a couple seasons now, and I can honestly say it has changed the way I hunt. There's no more guessing on wind direction, property lines, and stand locations. The app takes my hunting to precise new levels that help me be more successful. The new HuntStand Pro app unlocks unlimited property data on a nationwide basis, including detailed property boundaries throughout the United States and most of Canada, including property owners' names in the United States with detailed ownership information. You can also access detailed public land maps and search for properties on a county, state, or province level. There are so many features that also help you dial in on the best spots based on weather conditions. For more information, visit the App Store or log on to HuntStand.com. This podcast is brought to you by Cuddyback Cameras. I'm going to tell you guys, I've known Mark Cuddyback personally for over 20 years, and I've been using those cameras for over 18 years on Deer and Deer Hunting TV. The recent technology in the past few years has absolutely blown me away, and for those of you who don't have great cell coverage where you hunt, Cuddyback's ability to daisy chain from one camera to another camera with new CuddyLink technology is an absolute lifesaver. With the ability to connect 24 cameras, I place one home base camera at the edge of my property, swap that card out just once a month, and I get a look at all the activity on my entire property. My deer stay unpressured and the conditions are prime for opening day of bow season. For those of you who have the luxury of cell service, check out their new Cuddyback Tracks technology. This is game changing. For more information, go to cuddyback.com. Deer Talk is also brought to you by Traditions Firearms, a family owned business and inventor of the new Nitro Fire muzzle loader. When owner and president Tom Hall and his daughter Allison first showed me the Nitro Fire system, I was immediately impressed that it is not only more convenient than conventional muzzle loaders, but it is safer. The ability to quickly remove the powder charge is a big deal, such as when crossing a fence, climbing into or out of a tree stand, transporting your rifle in a truck or an ATV, or when hiking rough hills, wading creeks, or plunging through swamps. I've used the Nitro Fire on numerous deer and deer hunting TV hunts over the past two years, and I find it safe, accurate, and very dependable. The gun is available in numerous configurations. To learn more, visit traditionsfirearms.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Apex Outdoor Rewards. Hit record and win rewards. Enter the Apex Whitetail Challenge in your state for your opportunity to win big cash. Enter today and get a 4K camera absolutely free. That's a $300 value absolutely free. There are some serious rewards here, guys, so be sure to enter in your state. Who would have thought your next buck could be putting money in your pocket? Reserve your spot today at apexoutdoorrewards.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Full Range Mounting Systems. These mounting systems are a great way to manage all of your mounts in a stylish and organized manner. We are using their pedestal mount here on the podcast set for two shoulder mounts, and it looks just awesome. Be sure to check out all their mounting solutions at fullrangesystems.com. And finally, Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. Hey, if you've watched me on Deer and Deer Hunting TV, you know that I'm an equal opportunity bow hunter, and for most of the past decade, that has also included crossbows. In fact, I shot my first crossbow deer with a 10 point over 12 years ago. And to say that I've been impressed with their technology is an understatement. This year I'm shooting the new Nitro 505, the fastest crossbow in the world. It is light, compact, and includes the revolutionary AccuSlide cocking and decocking technology. Whether I'm in a tree stand, ground blind, or spot and stalk hunting, I know the Nitro 505 is up to any challenge. Check one out at a dealer near you or log on to 10pointcrossbows.com for more information.